come up and do the motions with us. Yeah. These aren't in the right order. These aren't in the same order that Sherry had them in. We should be doing Butterfly Song. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. All right, here we go. If I were a butterfly, thank you, Lord, for giving me wings. If I were a robin in a tree, thank you, Lord, that I could sing. If I were a fish in the sea, I'd wiggle my tail and I'd giggle with glee. But I just thank you, Father, for making me me. Cause you gave me a heart and you gave me a smile. You gave me Jesus and you made me a child. And I just thank you, Father, for making me me. If I were an elephant, thank you, Lord, by raising my trunk. If I were a kangaroo, Told our legacy folks about what songs they'd like to include this evening and it was very interesting to get the long list of favorites and so I started making check marks of you know which songs got the most votes and so that's what emerged for tonight and the first one we're going to share with you tonight is what a friend we have in Jesus. Thank you. 
Ja, grüß dich, ey. Good. You got it. Ready? You can do it. Just look at Mama, okay? Ready? I'm a little teapot, shown in self. Here is my handle, here is my cell. When I get to seen the hear me shout. Woo! Tip me over and pour me out. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Lucy. That was wonderful. All right, I'm now going to invite Mr. Michael Pritchard to come and do a poetry recitation for us. I'm going to recite a poem called Trees by Joyce Kilmer. I think that I will never see a poem more lovely than a tree. A tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the oh sweet flowing breast. A tree who looks at God all day and lifts her leafy arms to pray. A tree who may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair. A tree whose bosom snow was lain and in it tinkly lives with rain. Fools like me can make a poem, but only God can make a tree. Okay, our next sharing is going to be by Miss Jenica Pritchard, and she's going to be sharing a song with us. I stopped so you could hold me This child away Strong in the fight And thought you were the refuge That I can't wait to get to So I won't let a day go Won't let a day go by While thinking you for the joy that it brings in my life And who does something back away Your sun shines on my It's a beautiful day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When trouble seems to rain on my dreams, it's not a big, not a big deal. Let it wash all the bugs off my windshield, cause you're showing me. Drop tap down, turn up, I'm ready to fly. And ooh, there's something about the way your sun shines on my face. It's not so true, I can 
Okay, thank you to the Pritchard Boys and Girls. That's beautiful, thank you. Wow, now <coughs> you're going to have to put up with some grown-ups. <laughs> so some of us, and you'll see good um, examples of that tonight, some of us take hobbies into careers, or careers into hobbies. It can go either direction, I suppose. And so... Um, one of my hobby career things that sort of started back in 1966, I guess, or probably earlier in my church, was to be a teacher. And um, I taught my first piano lessons in 1966. And I have never had a day in my life that I've not been a teacher ever since then. And won't say how many years that's been, but don't do the math, please. Um, but. This last year, I taught my last classes officially after retiring in 2010, but eh, you know, who cares? Um, and so I decided I couldn't give up teaching. You know, I just couldn't give it up. And the Lord blessed me with a couple of very special gifts to have a couple of adult, of adult piano students to resume my piano teaching situation. One of them is going to join me tonight, and we're going to do a little duet for you. We're going to play it through once, and then we think it'll be familiar enough that maybe you might like to sing it along if we do it a second time or if we decide we can stand doing it a second time. <laughs> so please welcome my partner, Jerry Mitchell.
some of you know and some of you don't that uh, I was a stuntman for 50 years. It's not a made-up story. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, people ask me, well, what's the most unusual stunt you did? I didn't do that many unusual stunts, but the most unusual place that I worked was at Marine World Africa USA when they first built it. And they needed somebody to wrestle lions and tigers because nobody had ever done that before at an amusement park. So they found these cowboy stuntmen and they said, uh, want to wrestle lions and tigers? And he said, no. <laughs> and they talked us into it anyway. So in the beginning, we started with the tiger cubs. And they would give us six cubs at a time. And they're about the size of a large German shepherd, a little bigger than that. And if you remember the original Marine World, those of you that ever got there, they had all these waterways and little islands. So we were training the cats on one of the little islands. So in the morning, I would get up, I would grab a couple of the cubs, put them in a little rowboat, row it across one of the waterways, put them on the island, and go get two more, and each time, two at a time. So I had four on the island, I brought two more back, and as I'm putting them in the rowboat, I look over in the island, and there's a camel. And the cubs are going, they brought us a toy. And they're jumping up on this camel. And I can see the camel's distressed. So I throw the cubs in the little rowboat. I row over as fast as I can. I get the cubs out. I grab the other cubs off the camel. And I think, I'm a hero. And then I looked at the camel. And the cubs were gone. And the camel is ticked. And I'm the only thing there. And all I remember is this big, long face and these black eyes looking at me. And I said to myself, he's going to kill me. So I start running. And I took about three steps, and there was the camel. And I turned around real fast and ran, and there was the camel. Did you know that a camel cannot run a horse in a quarter mile? I didn't know that. So I'm running back and forth, and this camel, he, you know, all he's doing is this, basically. I'm running. He's just spinning around. Well, I'm wearing out real fast. Now, the guy that was training us was a Hollywood, one of the guys that they used in the movies, a big African-American guy that worked with the cats in the movies. Looked like a professional football player. So he's, he shows up, and he's across the water. And he goes, hit him, hit him. I could hardly raise my hands. So he, he jumps in, and that water was yucky. He swims across, and he looks around, and they're just building the place. That's why we were training the cats. And he finds a two-by-four. So he runs up behind the camel, and he hits that. And this guy was big. And he hits that camel with everything he's got right on its rear end. And the camel's looking at me, and he hits him, and the camel goes. And the camel spins around. And then I see Carl's eyes go. <laughs> so. Carl just came out of the water, so he turns around, he runs into the water, and that camel runs right in after him. You know those pool toys? That, as soon as the camel couldn't touch the ground, that's what he was doing. <laughs> so here's Carl in the water this deep. The camel's doing this, and I hear this, here comes another rowboat, only these guys have a little electric trolling motor, and the guy in the front goes, there's our camel! And the guy in the front grabs a camel. I still don't know how the camel got there. <laughs> Thank you. We are now going to be favored with a saxophone solo by Miss Amy Siegels.
Thank you, Ms. Emmy. Okay, I think we now have Miss, Mrs., I guess I can't call her Miss, Mickey Slizemore and her sister Carol, who are going to be sharing a duet with us. Carol, would you rather hold the mic or have it on the stand? You don't want to hold it? Okay. Thank you. I'm going to have you. Sister Carol, and we've sung together since we were little, just fun songs. So we're going to sing a little fun song called um, Shooting the Deputy Down. <laughs> 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 uh, Not too <coughs> spiritual. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> shot a deputy down, strolled along home and I went to bed. Well, I laid my pistol right under my head. Well, I strolled along home. I took my time. And I went to bed. Thought I'd sleep a while. And I laid my pistol. A big 22. Right under my head. I keep it handy. Well, early next morning about the break of day, I figured it was time to make my getaway. Stepping right along, but I was stepping too slow. Got surrounded by a sheriff down in Mexico. Well, I was stepping right along. I was a hot foot in it. But I was stepping too slow. It was a sultry day. Got surrounded by a sheriff. Boxed in. In Mexico. I didn't even have a chance to see the country. When, when I, I was arrested, I didn't have a dime. The sheriff said, son, you're riding free this time. Because where you're going, you won't need a cent. Because the great state of Texas is going to pay your rent. Because where you're going, I think he means jail. You won't need a cent. Why, he knows I'm broke. Because the great state of Texas is going to pay your rent. I'm mighty grateful, fellas. Well, I didn't have a key and I didn't have a file, so naturally I stayed around until my trial. The judge was an old man, 93, and I didn't like the way the jury looked at me. Well, the judge was an old man, too old, 93, entirely too old, and I didn't like the way the jury looked at me. I think they were suspicious. Well, the judge and the jury, they did agree. They both said murder in the first degree. The judge said, son. I don't know whether to hang you or not, but this here killing a deputy sheriff has just naturally got to stop. You got a point there, judge. It was the most unsatisfactory trial. They gave me 99 years on the hard rock pile. 90 and 9 on the hard rock ground And all they ever did was shoot a deputy down 90 and 9 It could have been life On the hard rock ground Well, they might have hung me And all they ever did Was shoot a deputy down This whole thing has sure been a lesson to me <laughs> Bang, bang <laughs> Thank you, ladies. That was fun. <laughs> okay. Now, among the things that you are going to sp see on display tonight are a number of things that have sort of become, um, like I say, hobbies that become businesses, businesses that become hobbies, and those kinds of things. And we have with us tonight a couple of authors. And they have a, a display that they will be glad to share with you later um, afterwards. But uh, they would also like to share with you a little bit about what got them going with this. So I'm going to invite Jennifer and Greg Joy to come and share with us.
Jennifer's just recovering from surgery, so we have to be careful about those steps. All right, a total, whoops, I think there's two. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, at a total hip about two months ago, I think, and still a little bit wobbly when I walk. So, um, gosh, how do I, I guess um, I'll start by saying both of us are in the medical profession or were, and, but I've always enjoyed writing, and I think Greg's enjoyed writing as well. Um, we had a place down in Baja, California, and one time I was at a beach party, and I was asking people, how did this place get started? It's about halfway down the Baja Peninsula on the Sea of Cortez side, and um, one lady was, somebody was talking about the freckle sugar people that started it, and I said, well, you know, somebody should write a book about this. And she said, well, why don't you write the book? And I thought, okay, I will. This is well over 20 years ago. So my husband, knowing that I do well with challenges, said, you know, I'm going to write a book too, and I'm going to get my book written before you do. <laughs> so he started writing his book. Um, as you'll notice at the table, there's a book with his name on it, but there's no book with my name on it yet. <laughs> so hopefully, um, maybe within the next month or so, mine will get published too. So, anyway. so um, let's see. So I, want, I was just going to read, okay, I guess I should say what my book, my book is nonfiction. It's about this place where we had a home in Baja. And uh, it's kind of like, how did it get started in this desert area with no road up and down Baja? So this was back in the 60s. It was a time when fishing was becoming very popular. And, um, oh, like movie stars were going down and flying into these resort hotels where they could go out and get the marlin and all. So this one man um, who was married to a woman that was previously married to Warren Buffett, um, he decided that he wanted his own resort. And so he, he actually had somebody show him this piece of property, and he says, oh, this would be perfect. And of course, the new wife, which wasn't a wife at that time, but she became one, um, they eventually decided they were going to build this thing. So it, it's kind of the story of how it got built, and then it kind of morphs into just, it's the first 40 years of that community, how it got started, and then what happened when all of a sudden we have people who are from the United States, and they go down there and think they can do whatever they want, and they forget, like, this is another culture, another country, other rules, but they feel like they have no rules. So anyway, I was just going to read, this is through, this is later on, so the hotel, so a hotel was the first thing that was built. And this, the man who did it, his name was Dixon Collins. And this is um, when it was just about to be built. And he's there standing, talking to the Mexican workers. And these people had to come, you know, some of them would walk hours and hours to come to the job site because there was, weren't many job opportunities. Okay, so it was a calm, sunny day in 1965 when Dixon Collins stepped up to address over 100 men gathered at the newly leveled building site at Punta Chivato. The construction phase of the hotel was about to commence. Although Dixon had put Lou Federico in charge of supervising the Mexican personnel, he decided to fly down from Southern California to personally give the men a pep talk before the work began. Dixon's stature was intimidating and the workers quickly became quiet and turned their attention toward the American. The hotel you are about to build will be unmatched in all of Baja, Dixon announced. When it is done, you will have been a part of what many thought was impossible, the construction of a resort on Punichivado Point. You will have reason to be proud, and so will your family for generations to come. Dixon con continued to elaborate on the merits of the project, but as he looked out over the sea of brown faces, he noticed a glazed look in their eyes. Suddenly, it dawned on him. They'd not understood a word he was, 
He was speaking English to Spanish-speaking Mexicans. As Dixon quickly wrapped up, he heard clapping. It started slowly at first, but soon all the men were applauding. Sweet Key, one of the workers, made sure of it. Dixon nodded to the men as he turned from the crowd. Not one to be embarrassed, he merely made a mental note that he should learn Spanish. Well, unfortunately, I started my book to get her to finish her book, <clears throat> and my book got published. <laughs> so I'm on the second book, trying to get her <laughs> to, to go ahead. My book is called Return to Annie. It's a uh, medical thriller. Primary character is uh, Dr. Uh, Ann Bennington, the chief of surgery at a small hospital in the Sierras. Just kind of a coincidence. <laughs> Uh, the hospital is called it was called uh, Odell Memorial. Um, Anne, like all of us, has a past, and some of it should have prevented her from achieving much of anything in her life at all. She and a uh, boy that she grew up with uh, begin taking Taekwondo, and she found this to be an excellent sport, but also taught her to concentrate on things, and it helped her through medical school, school, and finally a residency, and, and uh, uh, help her take, take care of patients. And basically, she became the chief of staff <coughs> of a, this small hospital. When the previous chief of staff was killed trying to uh, miss a deer on the way home from, uh, from work, she was elected to be chief of staff. Soon after she was chief of staff, <clears throat> an older man who had been on the medical staff for a long period of time uh, began to uh, uh, cause trouble with the medical staff because he didn't come in during a time when he was on call. And the result was that a boy came in, he didn't see him, and the boy ended up dying as a result. And uh, in defense of himself, he began to blame this on, on Annie. <clears throat> or Anne, uh, and the result is that the quality of care of the medical staff began to kind of fail. Quality of care had been very good under the previous chief of staff, and he built it, this up to a point where, in actuality, people were coming from all over the United States or being referred all over the United States with very difficult problems to come to this hospital to uh, get things fixed. Ultimately, <clears throat> she called a medical staff meeting and she wanted to accomplish four things, or to get four things across. One is a medical staff member. They were about to lose what they had worked so hard for, along with the people who had worked hard before them. And secondly, it was up to them to get that quality back. And third, she planned to leave uh, a leave of absence while they fixed the problem. And fourth, when she came back, if the problem wasn't fixed, she was going to go to another hospital where people already cared for her patients. She ended up with her boyfriend going to a uh, small area in Baja, very similar to what she was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and the day after she got there, her boyfriend was killed. And after that, she found herself in a situation where she was facing people who wanted to harm her, wanted to abuse her, and actually wanted to kill her. It grew into that. She had to use her resources during the book <laughs> to and, her, and her, uh, her abilities to get herself out of trouble and, and to save her life. The book <coughs> was, was published on Amazon. I haven't had a chance to take it anywhere else. Um, and so far, the reviews have been pretty good. Reviews say starts out kind of level, uh, but ends up so you can't really put it down at the end. If you get a chance to read it, I hope you'll write a review. <laughs> the more reviews, the better. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, return to Annie. Yeah. Yeah, and it's on the back table. You'll all get to take a look at it. Yeah, the book's back there. Pick, feel free to pick it up and look through it. Thank you so much.
Now, we have the Riley family is going to join us, and they're going to share something with us that I believe is going to become an audience participation kind of thing, a sort of our um, performance finale, other than the fact that we're still going to make some more joyful noise afterwards. So. So I started folk dancing in high school, and Michael start joined me when we started dating. So we wanted to share a folk dance with you, but it is so much more fun to do a dance than to watch it. So you all are gonna do one. This is an all ages dance. You can do it sitting in your seat. Um, and I know you all can do it because I stand up here and watch you do the hand motions on the kids songs. <laughs> you can do this. <laughs> so um, let's do it once and then we'll play the music, Jason. All right. 
Now, thank you. I think that really got us all warmed up to want to make a joyful noise, right? And we are now going to do our second kid pick. So, um, with Chris, and I believe that they have chosen to do King of Me, right? So, you want the kids up here again mm -hmm. to do that? Yeah. All right, let's get you kids up here to show us all the motions. And the rest of you, if you'd like to stand up and relax a little from that last workout. <laughs> During that last song, I just kept hoping someone would walk in. <laughs> <laughs> just thought that would be really interesting. <laughs> I don't know what they would think is happening, but yeah. Now, oh, this is a Pentecostal church. Okay. Before we do our um, concluding joyful noise together, just want to say some thank yous because not only to thank everyone who has performed or displayed this evening, but there's some things going on in the kitchen too. After we have done our final song and I've asked our, our lead elder, um, Rob, to come and do a closing prayer for us, then we will be treated. Um, there are people in the kitchen who've been working. The Friesens are operating the popcorn machine, so there will be popcorn available. And um, I believe Mrs. Haldeman and um, is Linda, Mrs. Friesen back, uh, the, um, Mrs. Frazier, Linda Frazier back there. They're working on some hot cider. And um, Terry Quinn has been baking some chocolate chip cookies. So I think there's some good things to happen that you can enjoy while you're, you know, meandering around, enjoying the displays. There are lots of things to look at. If you have a display, you might want to hang kind of by it so people can ask you questions about it if they you know, have questions about what you might have on display and um, enjoy. So we're going to conclude with the overwhelming choice from the Legacy Group, which I think will be familiar to all of you, and that's Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved. 
Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for our church family. Thank you for this evening when we could come together and enjoy each other's company. Thank you for uh, the display of talents, the gifts that you've given us. And we pray, Lord, that, um, that we use all the talents that you've given us uh, for your glory. And we do all that we can do for your glory. Bless us as we continue to, to interact and, and see the displays and see all of the talents. And um, Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to be your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, please enjoy the displays. And I'm sure that if you wander towards the kitchen area, you can find some things to um, enjoy as well. <laughs> 